Hi, I'm Christy Zwicky, and welcome to a City TV special on disasters. I'm standing in the middle of the burn area for the Gap Fire, which blasted through here last summer. And fire is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to disasters in our city. We also have a history of floods, landslides, earthquakes, toxic spills, and even tsunamis. These events have shaped our entire city and have forever changed the people that witness them. And since most of these disasters have a high probability of happening again, everyone in this city, including you, needs to be prepared. Santa Barbara. Our idyllic city has long enchanted people with its natural beauty and mild climate. But sometimes, nature throws us a couple of curveballs. The stars were misaligned that day. The moon was in the wrong phase because all the things stacked against us. The red cloud was a scary thing because it went up in the air and started heading towards downtown. I got the, I got the deck already. Okay, I'm out of here. We've got two strikes and another one coming. Uh, for that area, we've got 15 on order. There was coals the size of your fist blowing around in the air. And we just said, we don't want to be here. It's like seeing hail, but the hail is really red embers, you know, raining down on you. Nature will always take you down. No matter how well you plan, no matter how strong you're building, your flood channels, nature will find a way around it. Our region of California has been forged by the forces of natural disasters. So it's not a question of if the next one will occur, but when. Since 1950, when the state of California developed their Civil Defense Department, the county of Santa Barbara has declared over 25 disasters, most of them being flood and fire. So if we're going to be living in this area, then we need to prepare for the different types of disasters that there are. And we've been having them since the beginning of time. The topography of our region has been shaped by the movement of tectonic plates in the Earth's crust. These huge plates move under, over, and past each other along faults, and Santa Barbara has 23 known faults. Sometimes the plates get stuck and energy builds up over time until the plates break free. And when that happens, we get one of our most common natural disasters, an earthquake. Earthquakes, when the, if my hands are like the fault here, they propagate in a particular direction. And so it's kind of like a motorcycle coming towards you. You hear the So you'd hear this rumble, 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 then, then it goes away. And you can actually see that. Sometimes the earth will wave as that happens. And uh, the waves can be pretty dramatic and scary. In a big earthquake, you know, you might expect shaking 20, 30, 40 seconds. In a really big one, a 75, your worst case scenario might be over a minute. And the shaking would be sufficient that you couldn't walk. Uh, you'd be knocked to the ground. Santa Barbara is part of an earthquake hot zone which runs from Los Angeles through Ventura and along the Santa Barbara Channel. Frequent moderate to large earthquakes characterize this zone. We could also be affected by the most famous fault in the world, the 800-mile-long San Andreas. This map shows that movement along a 240-mile section of the fault will radiate shock waves towards us. Patterns of earthquakes show that the San Andreas will likely affect Santa Barbara in the next few decades. If you have um, an area and you have earthquakes all around it, you know, in a big pattern, there's none in, in the center, you would say that's a likely place for an earthquake to fill that gap. Or if you see a long fault and there's earthquakes all along in a number of places, but, but, but nothing in a particular reach, you might say that's a seismic gap. Right now we're in a seismic gap for the San Andreas Fault up near Fort Tejon. It hasn't ruptured since 1857. When the Chumash settled here thousands of years ago, Earthquakes were common enough to be incorporated into their culture. In Chumash lore, earthquakes were caused by the earth riding on the back of giant serpents. And when these serpents would move, the, the earth would tremble. And one piece of evidence we have is an archaeological site on Santa Rosa Island that's located right on top of the Santa Rosa Island Fault. And 
the testing that's been done there indicates that it was occupied at the time that fault moved. It must have been a tremendous shock to the people that were living there. In the 1800s, the first accounts by the Spanish show that Santa Barbara was no stranger to tremors, especially in 1812, which they called the year of the earthquakes. And it started around April or May, they started feeling earthquakes all throughout California. And then on December 8th, um, 1812, a huge earthquake shook Southern California, destroyed Mission San Juan Capistrano, was felt all the way up to Santa Barbara, and then a few days later, on December 21st, there was a second huge earthquake, and that one wiped out Mission La Parisima, which at its original site was in Lompoc, and then they moved it to its current site that we know and love. That was a very sacred time of year to Chumash Indians, and there must have been feelings about the timing of the quake and the fact that it occurred at the winter solstice, which is when the Chumash Indians traditionally celebrated the rebirth of the sun. Santa Barbara mission was so badly damaged they mentioned that they had to move all the services and held them under a ramada that they built. For months afterwards, when children are being born, they're, they're naming them Migdio and Midia, which is named in honor of the patron saint that protects people from earthquakes. As Santa Barbara discovered, something beautiful can come out of destruction. Several good things happened because of these earthquakes we got a new mission for Santa Barbara. The mission had a completely different design to it, so after being rebuilt, it had one tower, then a few years later got two towers. So thanks to the earthquake, we have the great mission architecture that we now have. In 1857, Santa Barbara shook again, this time by the biggest earthquake in the history of California. It's known as the Fort Tejon earthquake, estimated to be at 8.5 on the Richter scale. And this one was so big that they said that parts of the San Andreas Fault opened up 14 to 20 feet for about 40 miles. You could just see the gap going all the way down. Stories are that the Kern River flowed backwards. The Tulare Lake was flung out of its shores. And here in Santa Barbara, they said there was one strong shock that lasted for a few seconds followed by another shock that shook for almost a whole minute. And it kept rocking so much that the Mission Reservoir was just spilling on all four sides. Up at Point Conception, a lighthouse was destroyed. And for Santa Barbara, that was about the biggest piece of damage was the loss of the Point Conception lighthouse. It was universally noticed throughout the city and was so violent in its vibrations that all of the inhabitants fled from their dwellings, the majority of whom, on bended knees and hearts throbbing with terror, made fervent supplications that the imminent and impending danger might be providentially averted. This shock commenced with a gentle vibration of the earth, which gradually increased, accompanied with an undulating motion until it attained its culminating intensity, and then as gradually decreased until it ceased its action altogether. At dawn on June 29, 1925, Santa Barbara got a wake-up call that would forever change our city. Out of the Santa Barbara Channel came a magnitude 6.3 earthquake. When the shaking started, into my room appeared my grandfather in a long white nightshirt. <laughs> and that I had never seen before. And that's what really stuck in my mind. And he carried me downstairs outside onto the lawn where we camped for several days. I was lying in bed reading a book. I was eight years old. And suddenly, I heard this terrible noise, and everything started to shake. And the furniture, my chest of drawers was, you know, going to fall over. And I was terrified. And I threw the book down and crawled under the covers. And one thing that I remember, you know, we're not always conscious of the sounds of nature birds, something rustling in the bushes, a cricket or a frog, something like that. There was dead silence. Adding to the estimated $8 million in damage, about $100 million in today's dollars, was the collapse of Sheffield Dam. Built in 1917, it's the only dam in the United States to fail during an earthquake. It was just an earthen dam, and when the earthquake struck, 
30 million gallons of water flooded down Sycamore Canyon. It took a couple of cows with it and a couple of cars, flooded the Lower East Side. Downtown, the rubble was so thick on State Street that travel by car was impossible. Several hotels partially collapsed, other buildings completely collapsed, and 13 people were killed. And there was rubble all through the town. But uh, this uh, scene of being able to see into the rooms of the hotel reminded me of a dollhouse because I've always played dollhouse. What stands out in my mind is seeing this California hotel with the whole side peeled off and sheets tied together as a rope for people to come, I guess it was four stories, so they could come down to ground level. Immediately after the earthquake, people started flooding downtown. De La Guerra Plaza was where all the action was and all the city department heads showed up by nine o'clock. The Red Cross had a tent out in the De La Guerra Plaza providing donuts because people were out going to the ruins looking for people pulling rubble away. One of the big problems was no one knew what had happened. Was there a big earthquake in Los Angeles? Did something happen in San Francisco? All we knew was all the communication lines had been cut, no electricity, so a young man got a radio out of a store on State Street. He sent out a message and picked up a tanker out on the channel and reported Santa Barbara has had an earthquake. They relayed the message to another person who then relayed the message back again. So they got some communication going and found out it was just Santa Barbara. In no time at all, there were airplanes flying over the city taking pictures. These were some of the first disaster photographs ever done by wire and sent to newspapers. Out of the rubble, a new vision for the city emerged, one that would dictate the look and feel of the city even to this day. The ground had barely stopped shaking when community leaders were meeting and saying, this is our chance. Santa Barbara was a hodgepodge of false fronted buildings, Victorian buildings, brick buildings, adobe buildings. There was really no design to anything. It was whatever they happened to put up. And these community leaders realized that they had shining examples, the Libero Theater, the El Paseo, the City Hall, Santa Barbara High School. And these buildings that built in this sort of Spanish style had survived the earthquake. And they were saying, this is our chance. This is what Santa Barbara should look like. On June 30th, the day after the earthquake, the headline said, Santa Barbara to be rebuilt in Spanish architecture. And in no time at all, they started forming an architectural board of review. They had plans reviewed and as a result, you see the beautiful city we have today. In 1941, a 5.9 quake struck offshore Carpinteria. In Santa Barbara, it broke several water mains, disrupted power, cracked walls, threw items from shelves, and shattered 30 glass top street lamps. It also triggered a small landslide that covered the railroad and closed a lane of the highway. In 1952, Kern County was hit by a magnitude 7.7 .7 that killed 11 in Tehachapi. Even though Santa Barbara was 52 miles away, it caused moderate damage to the Carrillo Hotel and Balboa Building. Manager H.W. Hitchcock of the Santa Barbara Dodgers reported that the Laguna Park outfield took on a wavy appearance. This was caused by a phenomenon called liquefaction. Much of the city is built on a, an old lagoon that was there oh, 20, 30,000 years ago. Uh, that area has shallow groundwater, fine sediment, and probably would liquefy during earthquake shaking when the grains come apart and then the, the soil loses its strength. Another place is near the airport in the Goleta Slough area that could have a liquefaction hazard. In August 1978, an estimated 5.7 quake hit Goleta Point. Millions of dollars in structural damage occurred at UCSB, and hundreds of thousands of books were thrown to the ground. About 350 mobile homes were thrown from their pedestals, rupturing gas, water, and electrical connections. A landslide blocked San Marcos Pass, and a freight train derailed at Elwood. The 1994 Northridge earthquake, a magnitude 6.7, killed 57 people. Santa Barbara's Mission Ridge Fault System could produce a Northridge-sized earthquake, and one of the many faults in the Santa Barbara Channel could produce a magnitude 7.5.
If you look at a Northridge type event, we could look at 50 or 60 lives lost, property damage in the tens of billions. A 7.5, you can multiply that by a number of times. We know they've occurred here in the distant past, uh, and we hope we don't see another one. The most likely really big earthquake would come from the San Andreas Fault to our north, the San Ynez Fault over the mountains, or the Santa Cruz Island Fault, and these could be in the seven range. We really can't plan for the biggest disaster or the worst case scenario. We've got to pick kind of what's more intermediate, what can we likely expect in, say, a 50, 100 year period. And uh, that would be a mid six. And then we'll see a lot of fives and a whole lot of fours and a lot more threes and twos, and most of them will be out in the channel. Our history shows us that we need to prepare for the future by considering the potential results of an earthquake. There's a hundred different things that could happen in an earthquake scenario. We've got people trapped. We have fires. We have uh, water mains that are broken. We can't fight the fires. We've got uh, all of our resources are blocked by roads being blocked. We can't get extra help. If it's a big earthquake in Southern California, we're not going to get the help anyway because everybody's going to be dealing with the same problem. But I always think, I think, am I ready? Am I personally ready at home to cope with this deal for 72 hours or even more? And I don't want to sound like the prophet of doom, but my dad was here in Santa Barbara in 1925 during the earthquake, and he told me some stories, and it was pretty scary stuff. When an earthquake occurs in the Santa Barbara Channel, it also has the potential to trigger another disaster, a tsunami. Simply defined, it's a series of ocean waves of extremely long length and period. In the deep ocean, their length from crest to crest may be 100 miles or more. They can travel as fast as 600 miles per hour in the open ocean. The five states on the Pacific coast are the most vulnerable to tsunamis. We have had tsunamis in Santa Barbara, but they've been feeble. The ones I've read about were no higher than a few feet, a couple feet. I think one in 1812 supposedly wiped out an adobe house down near 101 and uh, Cesar Chavez Road in, in the old lagoon. Really big tsunamis that are generated from distant earthquakes in Japan or Alaska, uh, way northern California, will be modulated somewhat by our channel and the islands. So we have a local tsunami hazard. In 1929, archaeologist David Banks Rogers conducted excavations along the waterfront. What he found was evidence of a devastating tidal wave. Far back in the history of the settlement, after a long period of undisturbed residence here, and perhaps in the dead of night, a great wall of sediment-laden water had apparently engulfed the low-lying village clustered about the little cove. The frail huts had probably disappeared at the first onrush of water, and one wonders as to the fate of the inhabitants, surrounded as they were by low marshland, and their one haven of refuge swept by such a torrent, for we find their most cherished belongings still weighted with the mud of that fearful visitation. More recently in our tsunami history, a large earthquake off Point Arguello triggered an estimated six-foot wave in 1927. It caused slight damage to Santa Barbara and was observed all the way to Hawaii. And in 1941, a four- to six-foot tsunami was reported by residents after the Carpinteria earthquake. There's a tsunami warning system in the Pacific Ocean that would give us hours of advance notice if large waves approach California. And Santa Barbara is working on becoming a tsunami-ready city, which includes doing a functional exercise with emergency personnel. We're gonna maintain our checkpoints and the safe zones to prevent people from going into evacuated areas. Sometimes, you know, you can plan for it and plan for it, and when it finally comes, something different happens and you're gonna to have to be ready on the spot to do whatever needs to get done. So these plans kind of give us a, a framework of what needs to get done. And that's what the tsunami plan is gonna do. It's gonna tell us what are the best places to put traffic control points? What's the best way to evacuate people from the beaches? Where should we put them? Where should we put our own equipment? Where should we put our own staff? By having the drill, 
we're using the plan and if there's something that's kind of weird, we can fix it. Santa Barbara enjoys over 300 days of sunshine a year. On the days when the sun doesn't come out, the darker forces of severe weather can come out to play. Our history shows us we are no stranger to rainstorms, gale force winds, floods, and landslides. Probably the biggest landslide and debris flow ever to occur in Santa Barbara occurred a thousand years ago at Schofield Park. The whole park's a big bowl and all the flat places are slump blocks. A thousand years ago that blocked Rattlesnake Creek, a lake formed, probably 70, 80 feet deep. It blew out and formed Rocky Nook Park where all those boulders are poking up from there down to State Street. And so that was a gigantic debris flow that moved boulders the size of cars. Probably moved 20, 30 miles an hour, was like 20 feet thick. You'd have to have a really fast car in the right direction to get out of the way of something like that, but you'd probably hear it coming. Beyond that, there are smaller to larger debris flows after wildfire that can cause damage and move big boulders. After wildfires, tremendous amounts of sediment flush out. We live in a climate that has two seasons, really, mud season and sun season. During the winter, we get very intense rains. Santa Barbara has a notorious flood hazard as well. The whole city's built on an alluvial fan whose head is near the mission today. And, and in the past, it just flowed down through the city in multiple channels. And if you drive through the city, you can see them all over the place. And alluvial fans don't flood like a normal river. A normal river just comes up out of its banks and spreads out. Alluvial fans move the channels all over the place. So we see a lot of breaches of Mission Creek. Mission Creek only can hold a modest flood, and so it has a notorious flood hazard. Imagine what it would be like to deal with those forces of nature in 1914. In January of 1914, it was a banner three days of rains. Nearly eight and a half inches of rain fell over 72 hours. Sunday afternoon, nearly half that rain fell over a two hour period. And obviously the creeks just couldn't handle that. They were just overflowing. One story is that Mission Creek was as wide as a river. And Santa Barbara resorts back to what it used to be on the Lower East Side. It used to be the old slough. And so that's lower ground, so the water's just flooded down there. Throughout Montecito, the creeks overflowed and swept houses away, as happened in Santa Barbara along the Mission Creek, Sycamore Creek. And in Montecito, two people were killed, two very popular people, Lewis and Elizabeth Jones, who were heading home to think they were going to save their children, who had already moved to another location and were safe. But no communication, they had no idea, and it is suspected they were crossing one of the creeks when the bank gave way and swept them away. In 1983, the waterfront was blasted and flooded to the point of being surreal. We knew that we were having a, a storm surge. We had a high tide along with that, so we had lots of flooding. We were dispatched to the buildings down at the harbor to try to retrieve all the important records. But in the process of doing that, we found out it was even too dangerous for us to get close to that because of the storm surge. And there were cars in the parking lot that were abandoned, and they were large cars rolling, just rolling. And we were dodging them as they went through the parking lot. The waves were actually undermining the breakwater at that point, so the water was going underneath as well as over. It was quite a scene. It's hard to imagine what Mother Nature can throw at you. And the storms of El Nino in the 1990s showed us the consequences of having an airport built on a floodplain. So the airport was closed and flooded for several days. Big impact out there both for damage to the infrastructure and economic damage too because of the closed airport. But that happened twice to us out there and the only vehicles that could operate on the airport were the uh, crash trucks that were only trucks big enough to go around and check on people on the airport property. That was the only way that we could get there short of a boat. As it travels down, the force of rushing water can destroy bridges, roadways and buildings, potentially causing injury or death. In 1998, the floods poured through Sycamore Canyon. We received a call in the upper Sycamore Canyon area where the gentleman was washed from his home. And our engine company seven went down and actually then rescued his wife. It was a very, very precarious, dangerous situation. They were required ropes and, and carabiners and lines and stuff in order to get to her and she was hanging on 
to, I think, a doorway in the house when they finally got to her. So, um, you know, the water's really dangerous in that canyon if, you're, if, if it gets to be a big storm like it did. Santa Barbara's storms also highlight our vulnerability to isolation. Those beautiful mountains on one side and the ocean on the other leave us with only a few routes in or out. And due to the high cost of housing in our area, the number of emergency personnel that can afford to live here diminishes every year. We had huge areas, especially the Lower East Side, that was flooded. All the underpasses were like almost up to the bottom of the bridge. We were isolated from any kind of help. I mean, all the freeways were out, the trains were out, the ocean was too rough to come in, the airport was even flooded. So we were totally isolated, and that's something that can happen here in Santa Barbara. It's a concern, especially since some of our people don't live nearby. If the El Nino storms did isolate us, we may not seek extra help because of those road closures. And fire department and public safety is going to be very busy doing other things. They're not going to be able to check on every single person. So it's all back to preparedness by the individual and homeowner and, and families. Santa Barbara's greatest disaster hazard is wildfire, and our history goes back thousands of years. The Chumash used fire to promote the seeding of plants and to assist with their hunting and gathering. But that practice was made illegal on May 31, 1793. The first fire control ordinance in um, Spanish California was issued here in Santa Barbara. Governor Arriaga came here and made a proclamation that from now on, no California Indians could burn the native vegetation. That their practice of deliberately burning the coastal sage scrub for encouraging seed crops and game was no longer to be tolerated. But an ordinance can't stop the forces of nature. In his book, Two Years Before the Mast, Richard Henry Dana Jr. describes the setting of Santa Barbara in the 1830s. The only thing that diminishes its beauty is that the hills no longer have trees upon them, they having been all burnt by a great fire which swept them off about a dozen years ago, and they had not yet grown again. The fire was described to me by an inhabitant as having been a very terrible and magnificent sight. The air of the whole valley was heated so that people were obliged to leave the town and take up their quarters for several days upon the beach. Santa Barbara has an incredible history of fires going back centuries. And for a while there, it seemed like about every 10 or 15 years we'd have a catastrophic fire. Uh, it seems like that frequency is actually picking up. It certainly is uh, creating an incredible issue, not only in Santa Barbara, but statewide and nationwide. The Santa Barbara area in Southern California is a little bit different than Northern California in that the vegetation is very different. It's, it's a chaparral environment. Its ecology is designed to burn. That range is anywhere from 15 to 35 years. Because of the type of vegetation, because of the weather conditions, we get a lot of low rainfall, uh, very dry extended periods of hot temperatures, low humidities. That fuel is more susceptible to burning if there's an ignition. We also have two weather patterns that are very significant for us here in Santa Barbara. That is a Santa Ana wind pattern, and also what's called a localized sundowner wind pattern. That typically are hot, dry winds coming in from the mountains down towards the coast that increase our potential for these devastating uh, fires that we get in this area. And if you look at the chaparral up on the hillsides, you've got areas that haven't burned for 15, 20, 25 years. And a lot of the cases here, it's 40 and 50 years. You've got a lot of dead material. So there's a lot of stuff under that brush that's ready to burn. And it's a huge amount of fuel. I mean, if you think about a, a wood pile at home and the amount of fuel you have to heat your fireplace for a winter, uh, well, multiply that up by a million or two or three or four on the front country. And that's how much fuel is up there that's capable of burning and it just takes that ignition source and if there's wind you've got a disastrous situation. The whole mountain front along Santa Barbara has burned certainly in the last hundred years and so if you get a, a really big fire in a very windy day you just have to get out of the way. 
Even though we live in one of the most fire-prone areas in the United States, more and more people have moved into the urban interface or the areas where houses meet wildland vegetation. The biggest impact is going to be the evacuation of the public and getting fire resources in. History has told us and we've seen that we've had large structure loss during these fires and that is also due because of the proximity of structures uh, being so close to one another, the proximity of vegetation directly around a house and not having adequate defensible space increases that potential for uh, structure loss. When you're looking at an area where you've got an expanding community, you know, we've got lots right in this area here, more houses to be built. This is open grassland. But every house that's been built has created a certain amount of vegetation cover around those houses because people want to have nice things around them. They want to be in a nice natural environment. So as you've expanded these houses here closer and closer to the foothills and then you've expanded the vegetation that's here, you basically have the ingredients for a major fire. And you also have now associated values at risk. And if you look at Santa Barbara, and we're talking about the high values at risk uh, behind the city of Santa Barbara and then let's say taking the county Mission Canyon, you've got about $10 billion of property values at risk and those are all interspersed with a chaparral environment that is capable of burning. Fighting a wildfire requires being able to do your job in an inferno. You can feel the lack of humidity and you can feel the heat and the smoke is a big deal. Uh, it's one of the things that you, you can't really get away from. I remember looking around and it's just like a, it's, it's raining embers and they weren't coming down straight, they were coming down with the wind so they were kind of sheared off like the wind would be and just blowing all around. So you hear the, the sound of course of the engine constantly with the, the pumps sounds of your crew people around you. You hear the sound of the wind. It's incredible sort of howling. It's this really kind of unreal. Your ability to breathe and just see is so restricted. So it's, uh, it's uh, the hardest kind of firefighting that there is, is a wildland firefighting. Local fire historian Ray Ford describes how the forces of a wildfire can combine to create a monster of a firestorm. You can talk about fuel-driven fires, you can talk about wind-driven fires, you can also talk about topography-driven fires. So if you have topography where things are going uphill and you have canyons and you have fuel, you start to build fire, that heat then starts to generate its own weather patterns and as it starts to move uphill, it's starting to dry everything out and at a certain point when it gets intense enough and it's built up its own cumulus cloud of material, then basically what you have is a runaway freight train that's just moving uphill and because that column is generating a lot of cinder and large chunks of material and throwing them out. And it's actually starting to build spot fires out in front of that fire. So it's, the fires are already there before the, the major fire front hits. When any of those characteristics line up that creates a point in time where the fire is so intense that it's a self-sustaining fact, you've got a firestorm. In the last 60 years, Santa Barbara has come face to face with the threat of wildfire. Retired Fire Battalion Chief John Allman remembers the first time he saw Santa Barbara in flames. It was in 1955 at Refugio Canyon. Day after day we wouldn't see the sun. I mean literally around here you, once in a while you don't see the sun from the smoke but there were days you, you didn't, you knew it was there but you never saw it for, for a week or more. In September 1964, a car's broken exhaust system sparked the two-week-long Coyote Fire. It burned 67,000 acres, destroyed over 100 homes, and one firefighter was trapped and killed. The winds would come down at night, at sundown, last until the early morning hours, and then the wind pattern would shift to typical coastal wind pattern. The fire would burn back up the hill, and then at night again, the winds would shift and it would go down another canyon downhill towards homes. In 1971, an arsonist threw a makeshift firebomb in Summerland. 
The resulting Romero fire blasted unpredictably through Montecito and Carpinteria, trapping and killing four bulldozer operators. We could see the firestorm from where we were and we just knew something horrible was happening. That's exactly the time when that, that happened. We always feel that kinship among other firefighters, you know, there's that, and there's that closeness that, um, and it really hurt, that really hurt us. In July 1977, Santa Barbara was in the middle of a drought, water was being rationed, and hot temperatures made the brush on the hills bone dry. High winds blew a kite into a power line near Coyote and Mountain Drive, sparking a brush fire. Harry Linden saw it as it entered Sycamore Canyon. That's when things took a turn for the worse. The wind had just started coming up a little bit, and I think that's why the fire trucks got on the other side. They thought it was going to go up the mountain, and immediately, as soon as they got all lined up over there, the wind shifted, and it was first just a little breeze, then it picked up harder and harder, and before you knew it, it was like a, a gale. And the fire immediately changed directions and started coming towards us. Sparks started coming over our heads, and uh, some of the trees started catching on fire. Uh, it got over here probably within five minutes from across the canyon. It literally jumped the canyon, it flew across the canyon. There's a whole lot of confusion. You know, what do you do now? There was no planning in advance. We had just moved up here. So what was going through our mind was panic. We had three cars at the time, and there was two of us. And we started filling the cars up with stuff we wanted to take. Interesting, we filled all three cars up without even thinking about it. And we had to leave one behind, of course. Harry tried to save his exotic birds, but a wildfire doesn't stop for people or pets. I tried to let the birds out of their cages so they could fly free and it got so hot, so intense, I couldn't even touch the locks or the latches on the uh, cage doors. But while I was trying to do that is when I got burned. I just, uh, ashes were all over me, all over my face, there was no protection. And so I got burned on my arm and my hands. As the fire leapt from one wood roof to the next, lack of water pressure made it hard for firefighters to keep up with the blaze. I can remember uh, opening a fire hydrant on the top of, uh, I think it was Los Alturas, to hook up and I heard nothing but a vacuum. You could literally put your hand over the outlet and it would suck your hand to the hydrant. What was happening there is people below us, firefighters were using water too, but people were watering their roofs far in advance of the fire, uh, watering their, their yards and their roofs and that was taking away our precious water supply. At dawn the next day, the flames were out and the charred, smoky remains of about 200 Santa Barbara homes smoldered on the hillside. Later, the Lindens drove back to their home in Sycamore Canyon, past a doomsday neighborhood of ashes. Total devastation. There are fireplaces standing up and maybe a, a lawn chair completely un, unburnt. We had a can of lighter fluid on our back porch and that can of lighter fluid was still sit sitting there with the top melted off. All my motorcycles were completely melted into just blobs of uh, metal. There was a boat parked out here in the driveway. It was just down to a pile of ashes and dust and then the motor sitting on the ground next to it. I had thrown the jewelry into the car that we left behind. And when we came back, they found a blob of melted metal. And inside, you could make out the indentation of my wedding ring. So we took it to a jeweler and they pried off all this melted gold and silver, whatever it was, and they were able to salvage it because it's platinum. One of the biggest things we lost were pictures of our history. You know, we can replace everything in the house, but just, it's really difficult to replace your history. You know, when you lose all the pictures of your past and things like that, that's uh, something that's, you can't come back with. You start all over. The burning of Santa Barbara reached a new peak of terror in 1990 with the Paint Fire. Started by an arsonist, the fire burned over 4,000 acres, destroyed 648 homes, and killed one person. We're looking at an area where it's probably about three air miles from the start of the fire down to here, and it got here in less than an hour. 
What I remember is just the chaos of trying to get information of what was really going on. My recollection of just the visual that I saw is just these winds and embers uh, just blowing down through Cathedral Oaks. We had spotting up to a mile and a half ahead of the fire. Seeing the burnt houses, you know, seeing the, the fire engines trying to get up into those areas but not being able to because of the, the winds and the fire behavior. It moved so fast that by the time we had anything arranged, our hose lines arranged, the fire was far beyond us and it was already crossing Hollister and burning the buildings on Hollister. It was as fierce um, a fire as I've seen. It took out a lot of homes and actually jumped six lanes of freeway at 101. We pulled into the first road, the first right-hand turn in, in Hope Ranch, and there was a bunch of houses there that backed up to where the fire was coming from. And the wind was blowing right in our face, and we saw this wall of flame coming at us, and all of a sudden it stopped and shifted, went sideways to us. We were really lucky in that respect that it, that it did that, because if the wind hadn't sh stopped and shifted slightly, it would have probably blown all the way to the ocean. But I remember it was about 10 or 11 at night and we were there working on this house fire and the next thing I felt was a cool ocean breeze coming in my face. And we knew, we knew then that we were gonna, this was all gonna come to an end. In July 2007, sparks from a welder in the Santa Ynez Mountains started the second largest wildfire in California history, the Zaca Fire. It torched over 240,000 acres over two and a half months and cost over $140 million to fight. Fuel-driven fire, last year the Zaka fire was a good example of that, where you've got a lot of old, dead material that's dried out, getting later in the year with no water. So everything's ready to burn, but you don't have a wind driving it. You know, you have basically a little bit of topography, a little bit of uphill, and it's following corridors like a river system back in the San Rafael wilderness. The Zaka fire was a very different fire in that it was on the backside of the San Ynez Ridge. It was a large fire with a large potential to come over into the Santa Barbara front country, but very different weather patterns. We were lucky during the Zaka fire. We didn't get the winds shifting and blowing the fire up to the Camino Cielos and down into Santa Barbara. One year later, the Gap Fire spread over a week of panic as sundowner winds turned the fire from the hills towards Goleta. More than 2,500 firefighters from 28 states battled the fire as it burned over 10,000 acres. When you're looking at Old San Marcos Pass here, and you can see where the burn area is there, there was one small spot fire on Thursday night that went to this far next, next ridge over into almost where the, the paint fire was. Fortunately, it was only one spot fire and they were able to extinguish it pretty quickly. We were lucky in that we had the band of the orchards behind us. The weather finally changed, but it was kind of a, a wake up call for the community. I don't think there's a better way for the public to become fire conscious or fire aware than to actually look out their window and see it. So I think that there, right after a disaster like that, there's uh, a lot of attention and a lot of education. And then it tapers off as time goes on and we need a periodic reminder that it will happen again and again and again. And so we need to be aware of not letting our guard down. We keep that in people's minds and uh, conversations around the dinner table. How well are we prepared and uh, how much better could we be prepared? Another tragic fire was added to our history of disasters on November 13th, 
2008. The fire started up at the tea gardens, burnt its way down through Montecito and into the Riviera, taking out over 230 homes. And history almost repeated itself. We met Harry Linden earlier. He had lost everything in the Sycamore Canyon fire, and this time his home was threatened again. But because he was prepared, he was able to evacuate all of his birds in 20 minutes. Unfortunately, his house still stands, but some of his neighbors in Sycamore Canyon were not so lucky. And the tea fire reminds us that hot temperatures, fast winds, and low humidity are a recipe for disaster. I went over across the street and looked down in the canyon behind here and saw the flames coming up and it was starting to get very windy and probably, you know, 40, 50 mile an hour gusts and the embers were starting to come over the top of this hill. So at that time I said, you know, we should all get out of here. I was reading my daughter a book and um, the neighbors came by and said they saw a, a fire up on the hill and we could see a spot from here. And immediately I just started packing stuff. Um, we had stuff actually prepared for this. Uh, we had boxes and crates with all of our important stuff and I threw it all in my truck. And um, within an hour and a half we were driving, we were driving out of here as I saw the, the fire coming over this hill. When the McLaughlins were allowed to check on their house, they found that it was one of only a few left standing on Conejo Road. Everything else around them was reduced to a wasteland. We've evacuated before. We were in, a, in the slide in La Cachita as well, and that, that kind of shocked us a little bit. The last time we did this, we had to run from our house and watch it happen, and, and this time we were running from our house knowing that we weren't coming back, that our house was actually going to be affected, and it was, it was tough, and then to see you know, just the crowd of people knowing, trying to get over this hill yeah. was unbelievable. Um, the crowd of people on the roads, it was shocking. As city staff evaluated the damage and workers repaired power lines, we drove through an eerie setting of gray dust and scorched trees. Fragments of people's lives were scattered everywhere. These used to be children's bicycles. Here, the fire-safe roof was the only thing left. This blob of melted metal used to cover a VW van. You never, uh assured whether it's going to hit your home or not and uh, some people are lucky and some people aren't it's just uh, you never know what's going to happen. Something that we can see from Santa Barbara's third major fire in 15 months was the value of preparation. I think under the circumstances with the speed of this fire uh, the terrain the time of day the, the evacuation process went as well as could be expected. I'm not only proud of our personnel that participated, but I'm proud of the community. I think the pre-planning that we've done, the awareness of the people who live in fire-prone areas and their preparedness uh, and their ability to act on their own without direction and get, uh, get evacuated uh, paid dividends for us in the city. The situation could have been much, much worse. And so I wouldn't just see it as a, a fire and law enforcement effort. It was a community effort that we had sort of practiced uh, together that when the real thing hit, I think, uh, paid dividends for us in terms of safety. The city has prepared for future fires by creating a wildland fire plan that helps to lay out the potential threats from wildfires. What the city has done is to develop a wildland fire plan that actually outlines what is the potential for fire behavior and potential loss based on how a fire would burn. There's extreme areas where we call it the extreme foothill zone in our high fire hazard area and then we go down into our foothill zone where it's slightly decreased but there still is a large potential. So it's based more on the potential, not that we know where there is going to be a fire start. 
One of the ways that we're trying to prepare for minimizing the effects of even a wind-driven fire is through our benefit assessment district. We have a new benefit assessment district in the, the front country in the Riviera area and we're trying to reduce the amount of vegetation that there is to burn and uh, the residents in the high fire hazard areas have been really cooperative and we're reducing the fuel by tons and tons every year and we hope to continue that work on well into the future. Neighborhoods have gotten involved with the goal of protecting their homes and the city at large. It all comes back to taking personal responsibility. We've been able to witness the recovery over all these years. We're very aware that fire is part of the natural evolution of things in the mountains that they've always burned and they've always recovered. And, and so um, we really can't do much about that except to make uh, fire clearances, what we call defensible space around our houses. Well, I think the thing that we all need to learn is uh, to know our neighbors and understand who um, we can count on, who needs to have help, who the old people are, who are the people that are handicapped, where the children are, um, who's at the end of the longest road, um, uh, really underlining the fact that people need to have their land cleared um, so that equipment can come and go. This isn't a game, you know, this is, and we put into place all the things we've been practicing for the last 35 years. We have 27 folks on duty every day. We got 90,000 residents. And even though we have eight stations and we're stretched out all through the city limits, we run out of resources very, very quickly. Residents just need to really visualize in their minds what it might mean to have to evacuate, what it might mean to be isolated for at least three days. When it comes to natural disasters, we understand that it is a force greater than ourselves. But sometimes humans make mistakes. I wrote a column saying that the Santa Barbara Channel is a big body of water and it would take an awful lot to pollute it. But the oil industry had that capability. <laughs> it was. Uh, would not be at all surprising if it happened. That was two months before the blowouts. In 1969, Platform A, an oil derrick, blew out and gushed about 100,000 barrels of crude oil. Santa Barbara's ocean looked like someone had knocked over a deadly pot of black ink as it formed an 800 square mile oil slick. It actually didn't come in on the beaches in the harbor for a few days later. It took the tides a little bit to come in. Then when we went down there, first place we went to was Henry's Beach, and it was coming ashore there. And, and uh, you know the usual waves and crash, the blue water and the foam? It was just black and flat, and there was no noise. And the stench was horrific. And so everybody just stood there. They couldn't go near the beach, so they stood on the land looking out at the beaches, cried. Everybody stood there and cried. All of a sudden, you couldn't hear the waves breaking. You weren't even aware of the noise until it disappeared. And there was just silence, and the carpet of, of oil came in. The water underneath it receded, as it does, but the oil stayed there. And then the next swell came in. And then we began seeing birds flopping around. We've been picking, picking birds up. But then the big thing was, let's capture the birds and treat them. There was no way to treat them. So they all died. Hundreds, maybe thousands of birds died. And there was no way to clean up the oil. They had no way to figure out how to clean it up. So they brought in a bunch of straw and trucks. They dumped straw in the harbor and along the coastline. And kitty litter, they dumped in that. And that was supposed to soak up the oil. And then they had barges that brought, came in with pitchforks, and they brought in a bunch of prisoners, and they pitched the oil-soaked straw into these barges and hauled it all off to the dump. So the worst thing, I couldn't take my family to the beaches anymore. And I, I lived off of the ocean. I, I dove for lobster, but a uh, sportsman. I was a diver, I was a spear fisherman. So there went our food source, half of our food source went, uh, was gone, and fishermen, in Santa Barbara couldn't go out fishing. All their boats, you know, they closed off the harbor so they, they couldn't get their boats out to go fishing. It was disastrous. I mean, our very idea that we lived in Santa Barbara, we lived here because of the ocean. Couldn't go there anymore, couldn't live in that environment. 
In response to the oil spill, the environmental movement was launched right here in Santa Barbara. Bud Bottoms started an organization called Goo, or Get Oil Out, and got 200,000 signatures on a petition to do just that. This was the birthplace of offshore oil production in the world. And from the beginning, it was a mess and it was under very uh, definite protest. It was the wrong place to have an oil blowout, I can tell you that. Santa Barbara is one of the choice places in the world to live. You got oceans and mountains and a beautiful place to live. And nothing could be worse than destroying that. So that's the reason I think it still it exists, like Goo still exists today, because it happened in one of the most beautiful places in the world. Every day, an increasing amount of hazardous materials like rocket fuel, explosives, and chemicals are transported along our highways, railroad, and airways. In May 1984, Santa Barbara saw how quickly an accident could happen. I would say we're sort of a fledgling uh, hazmat team. We had the people, we had the training, we didn't have the best equipment that we could have had like we do now. That was a test for us as to how do we handle an major emergency on the freeway like that with an acid spill. At that time, it was the biggest thing that had gone on in the state for years because it affected so many people. As I recall, that particular load on that vehicle was an improper load for that tank. Over time, it worked its way into the pumps and gave way, and it sent this huge orange cloud over the west side, which was pretty impressive because we all knew what nitric acid looks like, fuming nitric acid, it has that red-orange look to it. When we saw that happen, we knew that something radical had happened. The hazmat out in the field is not like being in a laboratory. You know, in a laboratory, you put it, you have a substance, you know what it is, it goes into a glass, you look at it, you know what it does. In the world out here where we have spills on the freeway, it spills, it mixes what's, with whatever's in the dirt, whatever's on the freeway, oil, gas, dust, dirt, and it, it, it becomes something else. The terrain was such that it headed towards where we were set up. So we were scrambling to move where we were at, to move back. And fortunately, there was a storm drain between us and the vehicle, and it went right in the storm drain into Mission Creek. Fortunately, it went into the concrete line section of Mission Creek. And so it was easy to contain, and it minimized the cleanup. But the red cloud was a scary thing because it went up in the air and started just heading towards downtown. Fortunately, it got up high enough to where it didn't really affect people on the ground. But if you know the weather would have been different, if there would have been an inversion layer that kept that cloud lower, it could have been a problem for the people in Santa Barbara. Disasters, both natural and man-made, have shaped the evolution of Santa Barbara as a city and have forever impacted the people that have witnessed them. The voices of the past and the scars on the landscape tell us that we need to prepare ourselves for the future. The city of Santa Barbara is going to do everything possible in the event of a disaster and they need you to do your part. You and your family need to be prepared, and you should try to be as self-reliant as possible. The better prepared that we are as individuals, the more we can lighten the burden for emergency personnel and for agencies like the Red Cross. So now, we're going to give you an introduction to emergency preparedness. The city's Office of Emergency Services focuses on how to mitigate disasters in the city. We've created an emergency operation plan that has been approved by both the county and the state, and we use that to conduct trainings. Since the office has been developed, we've had one full-scale exercise in which we evacuated the residents within the Rivera area. We've also been training our EOC staff We've also been working to develop disaster service worker training and disaster preparedness for city employees so they understand what their role is during a disaster as a city employee and a disaster service worker. We're doing our best to, to, to help you out, but you do have to help yourself. You do have to be aware of, of the potential of disasters in this area. Your life is not worth endangering for your property. and 
you need to look at how you are going to protect yourself and your family during a disaster. What I've seen is anything that we think is withstand any sort of fire, any sort of storm, doesn't do it, can't do it. We are vulnerable, there's no doubt about it. And I think that that's something we all need to keep in mind. Any given day, I mean, today, we can have an earthquake um, or a fire, and is anybody ready for it? Are you ready? The first step is to find out what disasters the community is susceptible to. This program has introduced you to many. We all live close to a fault that could give us an earthquake. Do you live in a high fire hazard area? Do you live on a floodplain or near the tsunami run-up area? Step two is to create a plan with your family. Talk about how you would respond to each type of disaster and think about how you will communicate with each other. Pick a place to meet right outside your home in case of a sudden emergency like a fire and pick a place outside your neighborhood in case you can't return home. Step three is to create an emergency kit that contains the basics for survival. Store one gallon of water per person per day. Store at least a three to five day supply of non-perishable food. Assemble a first aid kit for your home and one for each car. You should also include at least one complete change of clothing and footwear per person. Don't forget utensils, basic tools, sanitation supplies, and a fire extinguisher. Step four is to practice and update your plan. Every six months, actually run through it with your family so everyone knows what to do. Update your emergency kit with food, water, clothing, and any new medications. If you're not prepared, you're not going to function no matter where you go. And there's going to be a level of anxiety and stress that's going to be placed on your physical body as well. Having a kit and having a plan kind of helps the whole rounded part of you. Your, your psyche, your emotions, everything about you is dependent on how well you are prepared. We don't do what we, we've learned, we do what we practice. And I use algebra as a big one. I mean, I took algebra, I even got an A in the class. But if you gave me a problem now, there is no way I'm going to do it because I haven't practiced it. But if you practice something and you practice it, then you begin to be comfortable with it that when it does happen, you know what to do. We hope this show helped you see the importance of taking personal action to prepare for a disaster. I'm going to go make another emergency kit for my car. What are you going to do? For more information, watch our four-part series, Get Ready Santa Barbara. You can also visit santabarbaraca.gov. There, you'll get all the details on how to be prepared. Thank you for watching.